İsmim Can Kozlu. İstanbul'u bir davulcuyum. 80'li yıllarda Amerika'da eğitim görürken hocalarımdan biri birkaç nesil müzisyeni etkilemiş George Garzon'du. Ben de George'un dünyaya yayılmış onlar da çocuklarından biriyim. Bu film benim bu alçak gönüllü efsaneye hediyemdir. Sen üç yılında George'u Akbank Jazz Festivali'nde beraber çalmak için İstanbul'a davet ettim. Her zamanki gibi George'la çalmak heyecan verici ve George'un deyimiyle Complete Pandemonium. <gülüyor> Festivalden sonra George Amerika'ya döndü ve uzun yıllar görüşemedik. 2012 yılında bir kez daha George'u iki konser için İstanbul'a davet ettim. Görüşmeyeli ve beraber çalmayalı 19 yıl olmuştu. Açılış gecesi 13 Cuma'ydı. George, nefes, bende kalp atışı. Davul zorla, bitti abi, gerisine gerek yok. Wild Turks and Wild Italians. Şimdi bu George gelecek diye oturuyorum buraya, böyle, böyle alıyorum baketlerimi. Ondan sonra artık başlıyorum böyle. Niye? Çünkü herif hayvan. I love these guys and John, you know, he's like spiritual. Bir tane e-mail yazdım, anladı, zıpladı. Geliyorum abi dedi. Var mı böyle bir şey abi? Ha? Mükemmel. Ee, var mı böyle bir şey ya? It's a crazy apartment. We have to take three elevators now. Really? Efendim? Kaçıncı asansördesiniz? I called Jan and I'm like, you know, we're on the elevator coming and he's like, which one? <gülüyor> I love it. Only John, three elevators. <gülüyor> Böyle bir eşi benzeri yok galiba. Üç tane nasıl? There was some kind of important vibe for coming here. I really came to be with John, you know, because he just out of the blue emailed me about doing this, and there was something in that email that was he was calling me. He's like, "Come over and let's document this," you know. I was like, "Wow, that's heavy."
thing about being an artist or a musician or anyone or human is you've got to keep your ears open and listen to what's happening around you. You've got to be that's that's my problem. I hear too much. You know, sometimes I wish I heard less, but I'm too I'm very sensitive to what goes on around me. To me, like being creative is looking out this window at this whole scene. Uh, you know, it, John is in a place where we're overlooking what the Bosphorus see and you know, the traffic of, of the ships and the boats and you know, I see a lot from traveling around, but this particular point is catching my eye, you know, to, to have a, op, an opportunity to sit here and just gaze at this. I find myself just checking it out, you know. I'm kind of drawing that in so that I can play tonight. I want everything to flow. I mean, that's what I, I'm, I'm about. It's like tonight. We don't even know what we're going to do. I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't want to know what's going to happen. What excites me is the not knowing, not knowing what to expect. When I hear there's no reading or no music stands, then I know the shit's going to hit the fan. John's great. No music stands, no music. He's like, oh, here's this melody. Ba, ba, ba, ba, ba, ba, ba, ba, ba, ba. That's it, and then we go. And I know what these guys, this is, you know, it's going to be pretty ferocious. I mean, I wouldn't expect any less than craziness. Böyle bitiriyor, çok büyük bir challenge. Ne olursa olsun çok büyük bir challenge. Yani büyük bir zorluk neredeyse. Herkes için. E, drive tam olarak belli değil. Neredeyse e, neredeyse şoför olmayan bir araba filmlerde gördüğümüz. Fakat araba kendinden gidiyor. Bir sürü parçacıkları var. O parça olmazsa araba gitmez. İlla şoför olması gerekmiyor. şey var yani bu erişmeye çalışmakla da alakalı. Ne bileyim evet ellerimiz kullanırız bir anda uzamaya başlıyor. Ee, ne bileyim e, bir şeyleri geriden alıp sanki ileriye götürmeye çalışıyoruz. Yani ne olursa olsun ben her zaman transition'ı konuşmuşumdur. Ee, transition dediğimiz yerde hiçbir zaman için kalma yoktur. Yani devamlı bir e, böyle indefinite flux influx situation yani hiçbir şey belirli değildir. Artık sağlıklı gidiyorsa size kalmış sağlıksız gidiyorsa zaten sizin elinizden çıkmış demektir her şey.
hope this will bond you forever. You understand what I'm saying? Definitely. I hope it will bond you forever. Always do that. Never forget those days when you were kids. Because no matter where you go, you still come back to me. Oh. George Amerika'ya döndükten sonra e, işte müziği ve filmi izlemeye başladım ve çalarken biraz farkına var, varmadığım ilginç e, anlar vardı. Tardo Destin is Saudade. It's a nice word from Portuguese. Saudade is a, it's a long game. It ha involves love, uh, sadness, and this and that. But I never realized that this guy is gonna cry on his tail saxophone. And he's gonna cry. Three octaves he does. And now we know we are in a special territory. Garzon is a, obviously a very Zen personality. And he used to wake up five, six in the morning and practice these long tones, long sustained notes. And you know, watching him do this, it, it looks simple, but as like many things with George, he plays so much with his emotions that you don't see the, I mean, he camouflages the, the craft behind. I'm sure it takes hundreds of hours to have just this, the sound, but he makes the sound natural. It's like, it sounds like a feedback is coming from. And then he pulls out the saxophone, he waits for my crash, and he's waiting. as a master improviser. Yeah. Garzon's concept is that when he plays free, he wants to give structure within the freedom so that the audience can have uh, uh, something to hold on. There are examples of this. This is like the very first tune with every year. She came from my apartment. I play with the gong and we just go on playing. That was totally uh, a free piece and I noticed that I start playing a couple of minutes and at what point I, walk, I do this like I go with my sticks on the cymbals in a certain way and I produce harmonics on the uh, on the cymbals and it, it didn't last even like you know one second but he suddenly started on a harmonic pitch on the saxophone I do something and it comes again. It comes a third time. So all of a sudden you realize it's a motif you know, through repetition. And 
Uh, that's how, within the freedom, he structures the, the, the piece. Mm -hmm. Come again. See? That's how he structures the free, the free form. George has so much experience doing this so many years that uh, every time we end the tune, it's the tune ends there. You know, you don't say, huh, why they stopped or man, that was lingering too long. We do a phrase unison together that is so complicated that even if it was written, we couldn't pull it off this way. Yeah. And he pulls off from the mic. And later when I watched this, I said, maybe he finished the tune there. See? This is body language. He looks at me and goes again. So this is... I'll never know. We have to ask him, you know. No one says like... I mean, if this tune stops, it stops. And if someone else has something else to say, that's fine. You know, it's not against the law. You know, it's not wrong. See, that's what... The thing about playing free is there is no wrong. The only time it's... I find that this is wrong is if someone overplays and they keep playing and they're totally ignorant to the people around them. I mean, if you stop and then someone goes on, it's just another little chapter. You know, sometimes people think too much about, oh, it's got to go perfect, it's got to go this particular way. Yeah, but you're playing free. So which way does it go? There's no way it should go. You know, it just goes the way it goes. That's why I like playing free. So I'll tell Johnny, I said, no, that's fine. He knows. Sometimes people think too much, too. You know, for me, like teaching here at Berkeley, I've been here for almost 42 years, and, you know, I've met all kind of, you know, international musicians because this, this school is so diverse. You know, the history and lineage with some of these deeper musicians, you know what I mean? When I say deeper, I mean, you know, the depth goes beyond just playing. There's, you know, something about the history of them being from Turkey or being Turkish and, you know, just having so much soul <clears throat> because of where they come from. And that's, that's what attracts me to them and that's what attracts them to me. So I get a chance to meet people like Aiden and, and John mm -hmm. and they kind of gravitate towards me because of the way I play with my band. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Third Night of Boston Service. Music Festival and Eric Hewitt, your festival director. You know, growing up as a young saxophonist in Boston, um, we're in the presence of a saxophone legend tonight, and it's an incredible honor to host the Fringe in this spiritual music and to take a journey through composition and improvisation that is rooted in jazz, but which goes way beyond jazz. So, because they need no introduction, and without further ado, George Garzon and the Fringe. George is from Boston. He started to teach at Berkeley in the mid-70s, and basically created a scene for himself in the Boston area. Created a group called the Fringe. Well, that was probably around 1974. Rock Lottie on drums. Got a lot of on the George and I uh, uh, started the group together uh, with, a, with a different bassist than we have now, John. And George, George and I, we, we both really uh, kind of developed our own material while doing the band. 
we do weekly sessions, we would smoke shit and drink vino and get fucked up and just listen to all this fucking music. And then all of a sudden one day we were playing the record me and the shit just took a left. <laughs> never came back. I mean, I had no idea about what playing free was about. And then we just, it was like this path that was meant to be for us to go on. It's just something that went there. It wasn't like we tried. You know? That's the thing about this music. You know, you can't force improvisation, you can't force jazz, you can't force the artistic, creative motion. You gotta let that shit happen. I mean, with the fringe especially, it's, uh, you can pretty much do whatever you want. And, um, and as long as it kind of feels good. Next year is the 40th year of this band. We've played every week for these 40 years in front of one of the toughest audiences in the world, the oh, students. Because the students will tell you in one second whether you're good or bad, and they would come every week. Great bass player from Bulgaria called George Donchev, who uh, used to live in, in Boston at the time, he, he asked me, so have you been to church yet? And I was like, I, I don't go to church. And he said, no, have you been? <laughs> he meant the fringe. <laughs> to him, uh, going to hear the fringe was like going to church because it was such a spiritual experience. thing about the Monday night fringe concert has inspired generations of young players. Discovering the fringe at 18 um, was profoundly important to me. I didn't really understand what was happening, but it drew me in. Jeff Tane Watts, when we were in Argentina, told me, like, yeah, we used to make the trip out to the Willow every week, which is a club in Somerville, Somerville, Massachusetts. They would come in snowstorms, take the bus. We used to go to the Willow Jazz Club uh, in Somerville, we'd tramp out there in snow or rain or sleet or whatever with our tape recorders, and we had these cassette collections of the fringe. They could be very free, but very much in control, going in and out of like totally improvised pieces and actual tunes, uh, changes or just screams. <laughs> Getting to hear him play with the fringe, to see guys improvising and communicating on such a deep level was a real impression. They would just go for it. You heard them collectively as a group, jumping off into the abyss and not looking back. I think that really gave us a desire and a license to do that. It's a living organism. It's not about like, oh, here's the bass solo and here's the drum solo. It's like everything at once. You know, and at any point, at any point moment, the shit could just go AWOL. came to me and he said, Mela, I think that the drummer for our trio is not gonna be able to play. Uh, do you want to play with with us? I said, who, with George Gasson and the, the French? 
at the lily pad, and I was like, what, me? Wow, yes, please. But I don't hear about John Lockwood or George Gasson about what we're gonna play. And I asked again to, to John Lockwood, John, should I ask George Garzone what, what music we're gonna play? He said, John Lockwood answered to me and he said, no, please, no, don't, don't ask him anything. Just listen to the music that he's playing, follow him and play with him what you heard. When Josh Garzone started playing the note, one, the first one note, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is what I've been waiting to play all my life. You know what's unusual about a player like George? Is that he actually creates music. He's not recreating anything. There's a lot of players that play really well and that play great, but they don't really create within the music. He creates music within the music. And he's an exploratory player, influenced deeply by John Coltrane. <laughs> Did you ever get to a point with him where his achievements almost became oppressive? You know, when you sort of felt like, I gotta get away from this guy. Never. Uh, and even when I thought I was getting close, there were some points where I'm like, wow, I think I'm getting close to train, and I put on a record, and I listened to that sound, and I realized it was, he was so many light years away from me. But his wealth of information is never ending. I would probably be in the ground before I figure out a quarter of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's how much of a legacy he left. He's a master of, of his instrument, and uh, he's nuts. He's out of completely out of his mind. So that influences the music. <laughs> Okay, that's fine, but let's play it fair. Bring it on. <laughs> George Garzón, my man. Only crazy stuff goes down when I see him. <laughs> greatest musicians that I've ever heard, performed with, been around. It only took one note to know that he was moving and bending the world in a different way than everybody else. Hearing him live, my God, and hearing hearing him all the time uh, is is shocking because his sound is so enormous and it's and it's raw. <laughs> He plays exactly the way he is. His playing mirrors his personality better than any musician I know. Unpredictable, but focused like crazy and crazy. He just played from his heart right from when I first met him, regardless of if it was all the correct notes or all this kind of technical stuff. What 
you guys are responding to is this incredible connection to his heart. And he doesn't care what that music becomes. He's receiving it. He's never questioning it. He has a stamina, a flow of, of energy and ideas that feel is endless with him. And the possibilities are endless. And the joy is endless. Man, just the way he plays free, it's so, you know, he can just play forever, when, just when you think the energy is high, not high enough. He <laughs> shit <laughs> It's unbelievable. It's a celebration when he's playing, and I don't get this feeling with almost anybody when I go listen. When you listen to somebody, I mean, a musician that plays an instrument and touch you very deeply and very hard in your center, um, and at the same time it inspire you, you have to to take it serious because it's something that you don't feel every day. What he instills in his students is to be fearless, to try things, you know. Don't be just conforming to the rules. Matter of fact, break them and find out why, you know. So I think he's, his legacy in teaching will be that he allowed students to uh, really investigate themselves. You know, he has generations of students that are going to carry on his uh, inspiration. His raw passion was probably the most inspiring thing I've ever I've ever had as a teacher. Just just the real uh, get rid of the other stuff that you've been you've been studying because that's not really necessarily music. When you play free, it's something you've got to like learn how to do. You know, you got to you know you can just get up there and go ape shit. That's one thing. You know, just go nuts. But how to craft it and make it sound uh, like it's something that takes years of work. The way he improvised. And kind of mel marry his free playing with his playing on changes, which is super bad. I can teach it to you, show you how to play it, and get you to play free. I have all these intellectual kids in a master program that are just devouring this shit because it's so simple. <laughs> you know, no one ever said to them, oh, take major triads with half step in between, don't repeat the inversion. Like, what? And then they try and do it, and it's really difficult, but they can see, you know, you'd see in one semester how their heads are opening up, you know? I'm indebted to George because I've developed my, my style and my, my way of playing because of him. George is the Morpheus of my life. I definitely would not be the musician I am now in terms of language and some, would, some ways conceptually if I hadn't studied with George Garza. Studying with George was, a, was beyond, like, a teacher's student, it's more like a master-apprentice type of relationship. I have a feeling a lot of people that have studied with him have this type of relationship with him. He really helped me um, hear what things that the saxophone could do that I didn't realize before. His effect on me was basically to get outside of myself and not uh, micromanage every note and every rhythm that I was playing and kind of be loose and, and actually hear Hear the, hear the tune and use that as uh, as the beginning instead of being locked inside of it. While I was studying all these things that were supposed to happen in music and in improvisation, he was telling me all these things that could happen. He looks at a song and thinks of what, what possible colors we can use over them uh, without being locked into the harmony that was already prescribed. And he would just throw all these different ideas and it's stuff that seems logical but i would never have thought to play it so you got to think about space you got to think about this and then get out of get, get outside of yourself get outside of this get, you know like all these different uh just more like general ideas that related to how to approach playing music <laughs> You know, because when you play just the melody, you're holding the notes. It's like the violin. You play a long tone, you play a long note, 
He had me do this exercise that he called picking notes out of a hat, where on a piece of music paper you would write out individual notes on the staff and then with scissors actually cut up each individual note and put it in a hat and then pull the notes out and rearrange the intervals in a sequence that was completely random. It's an interesting way to question or reevaluate melody in melodic lines. I think he helped give us, his students, some ideas about how to forge melodies in different ways, ideas that were maybe generated from some kind of system that were not necessarily intuitive, but through trial and practice could be assimilated and feel more natural. George can find a melody in a haystack. You know how you find a needle in a haystack? George can find a melody in a haystack. It really helped me to figure out how to change harmonically very fast. And he would just write out, uh, I don't know if it's random or whatever it was, but he would write out chords. He said, play over them. So I started doing that myself, just to be able to change direction quickly, but make, still make a harmonic statement. That's the thing. I have an avant-garde ensemble here that started like in 1977. And it's been going ever since. I uh, ended up in George's avant-garde class, avant-garde ensemble at Berkeley. There was a lot of crazy stuff involved. We play some of my tunes, and then sometimes I'll just shut the lights, and we play free. He would turn the lights off, or um, just start speaking in tongues. Because I noticed the kid, we'd play free, and the kids were like, you know, just kind of we mean, you know, do this thing, and then I was like. Fuck it, you know, and they shut the lights and all of a sudden they couldn't see each other and they just started playing this completely bizarre shit, you know? Because they, they you know, they didn't have, like, I wasn't looking at you, you were looking at me and they were like, wow. And this thing became a thing. I remember having him the first time and he just turned off the electricity, the light, and he just said, let's play. And I was like, wow, where is this guy coming from? <laughs> yeah. Interesting to hear them remember that. You know? Çok playful bir adam. Dolayısıyla hani bir herhangi bir yerde işte elektrik kesilirse falan zaten akustik ale çaldığı için onun da pek bir sorunu değil. Çalmaya devam ediyor mesela. the lights in the club, the electricity went out and it was pitch black. And you realize, I just realized, you're in this like free jazz nightmare. But George Garçon, you know, it's just like, it's just wailing away. And, and it really became this thing like, this is maybe number one, how this music should always be presented. <laughs> Man, this is really inspiring in a way because we're just on the planet, like where is this happening right now? Turn the lights out and play and just go for it. Of course, the triadochromatic approach, his pedagogy, I've completely embraced and made it my own. And George never cared that I was a guitar player studying it. He didn't care who studied um, with him. I had one guy from Romania, big guy, like freaking huge, who played pan flute. I didn't even know what the pan flute was. When I arrived at Berkeley, I was waiting uh, uh, the wind in the department to get a, a to get a, a teacher. And uh, I, all of a sudden I hear this amazing type of playing, like, like, from, like from another planet, like the angular style, like uh, George would like to call it, in and out and such a playing and really, really, really ballsy, like And I got all of a sudden, my, my, my, my hair was like, I got goosebumps. I'm like, who is this guy? Who the fuck is this guy? I want to I, I wanna, I wanna see him. I said, well, where's your saxophone? He's like, I don't play saxophone, I play piano. I went to his uh, class, and I said, I would like to take some classes with you. I played the pamphlet. He said, what? The pamphlet? Like, what the hell is that, you know? <laughs> I mean, I kind of had an idea, but... And he pulls out this, like, you know what a pamphlet is, like you blow. And he says, I want you to teach me how to play bebop. Oh, like, holy shit, you know? And uh, 
I started playing for him because I, I wanted, I've already, I've already played for many years, but I didn't have the jazz vocabulary. He taught me a lot of things in, about jazz, of course, first of all, about the uh, angular playing, about improvisation, chromatic approach, and uh, second of all, about uh, life in general and uh, the whole spectrum of, uh, of jazz. He's a, he's a really, really, really deep, deep guy, profound and, uh, in my opinion, one of the most uh, amazing musicians I ever met. He has such a, a unique way of playing anyway that he influences most things that, that he's playing in because the way he approaches things is totally George. George Garzon is a guru to a lot of musicians. He doesn't realize how much he's affected the lives of many, many musicians. I think he's been an influence on an entire generation of saxophone players. You know, his reach goes really far. Everybody has studied with him. From Mark Turner, Josh Revin, like it's, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. We're all sons and daughters of Garzon. But nobody sounds the same. And they all, if you ask any of them, they'll be like, yeah, man, George, it's a bad dude, he is the man. You know, when I think about, you know, all the students he taught, now I'm doing some teaching myself, George is very patient. <laughs> if you've gone to any George gigs or fringe gigs in New York, it's always full of his students, current and former students. Every time I see him, there's just, it's like lines of, of cats that just want to tell him they love him and thank you. And I think that speaks a lot to his nature and his soul, because people want to be around George. From Australia to Chile to everywhere else in the planet, people are waiting for the arrival of George Garzon with the sound that will heal this world. Big inspiration, big force in, in the music. Still, besides of being one of the great saxophone players of our time and a very influential teacher, and very important how many people he's influenced. His influence is not only the music, but he influences everybody's lives. George is a sweetheart, the nicest guy, easiest person to be around, and always amenable to playing whatever you want to play, whatever, wherever. It's a great, great person. Well, he's kind of underground in a sense. I mean, a lot of a lot of the major players all study with George, and um, and yet some of them are maybe what more well-known than he is. So he's kind of an underground guy, but whenever they talk about him, they're talking about him as a, as a strong influence in terms of their careers. And so in, in some ways, he's only started going, getting notoriety in the last 15 years or so, 15, 20 years. People don't understand they get hell bent on trying to make it. What is making it? This is making it. And I'm not like hell bent on putting out a, a, like five records a year. I just like doing what I'm doing, like just playing free and going to the gig on Monday night. It's like I live off of the gravitational pull. I don't force anything. Yeah, I thought about moving to Italy. I thought about moving to Copenhagen. I thought about living in Las Vegas, but this town kept pulling me back here. And a lot of it was because of the band. Well, the bands went together for 43 years. This was as long as long as I'm on jazz quartet. Someone up there dumped this whole scene in our lap. It's like here in Boston, you get an idea of the level of the shit that's going down on a Monday night. I don't need to leave that. No, even the New York cats know that that's why we live in Boston.
perplexing heck that, that if you're not a musician, it's hard to find the groove. You have to look for for the groove and how to make it. You know, you know, you're plugging into something that most of the planet will never see. <laughs> is enough music for the next six months, you know. Still, the amount that will go down, you know, will last us. of it than it is what we're playing. There's two things, it's what you're playing and the aura around it. You know, people can go and play all this shit and be like, oh yeah, that's great, but you don't feel that that golden sun around that thing. The only place I go there is with that band. I mean, you can play free with Hyde and John and other people and you'll get this other thing, but with that trio, that's, that's what you get. No one can duplicate that. When that band dies, the fringe is dead because, you know, it's like anything, nothing is forever. Mm -hmm. 